Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, good, good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, and welcome to episode 93 of Podchat Live. We are recording this uh, 27th of May 2021. And uh, Really excited to have uh, two people uh, who are big fans of their work, uh, both associated with Cause Health. Um, we're going to talk a bit, let them talk a bit more about what, what that is in due course. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Rani Lil Anjum, who is one of the co creators or developers of, of Cause Health, um, and Mr. Alex Murray, who is a podiatrist and one of their education partners. And um, Cause Health, and I'm going to let them go into much more detail on this but my my sort of uh, and I'm no expert but my brief understanding of it is it's a it's a project which is focused on rethinking causality complexity and evidence in healthcare and we all know uh, in daily life that causation and the principles and uh, of causation sort of influence almost every decision and interaction we have with our, with our patients. Most people are aware of, of the adage, you know, correlation uh, doesn't equal causation, because uh, if it did, then we'd know that uh, every time Nicolas Cage released a film, there was an increase in swimming pool drownings, and that one's courtesy of spurious correlations on the internet. But we're going to go into a much, much deeper uh, level of, 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 of dare, we, dare we say, philosophy um, about causation and how it applies. So, I might start, Alex, if, if I may, by coming to you, because I'm, I'm fully conscious that most of our audience are clinicians and what I've said may well have already made them reach for the button to switch off. So your, your mission, uh, should you choose to accept it, is to try and convince our listeners why they should stay listening to this episode, why this is such an important uh, thing to consider as a podiatrist, as any clinician. And perhaps you could go about that by telling us how you got involved in Cause Health and what it, what it brings to you as a, as, a, as a clinician and what it brings to your practice. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think I, I would start um, really with, with my background because the, the first thing I'd say is I'm not a researcher. Um, I'm not involved in any research. Uh, I am 100% a clinician, and um, but I also do so education. So it's really everything I say is is all about my own desire to try and like help become a better clinician, and then in the in the um, and then pass that on to people and, and, and educate them and go, well, this is what I've, what I've learned to try and try and help you. So it's not coming from a, from a base of research. Uh, I'm a podiatrist and a strength and conditioning coach. I, I work in Canberra. So I work in both general podiatry and um, high performance sport uh, arenas as well. So hopefully that, that also keeps a few people to realize this is really down to earth. This is what we do with, with not just these one-off patients as well, that this is, this is every patient and this is the, often that sport context, everyone goes, Oh, it's sport. Um, so really what, what sort of happened with me is, um, I, I was in a clinic, uh, I, um, I worked for quite a prominent podiatrist here, um, and, uh, joined when I was, when I was a new grad and came along and I just started seeing things that just didn't make sense. So I would see patients that, uh, my boss would have seen, we'll do the same treatment, different results. Um, we'll, st I'll be, um, seeing similar people with really, really similar conditions, completely different uh, backgrounds to how that, that um, condition came about, but the same treatment. And um, I've also seen patients that come in that with really, really what looks like similar conditions should be similar, similar treatments and get completely different results. So this idea that, you know, we were identifying a, a diagnosis, something that was going on and saying, this is, this is the one condition, this is the exact treatment that's going to work, just didn't seem, just didn't seem to work. It just didn't seem to apply. And the more I tried to become very systematic in approach, it just, it just wasn't making sense. And to a certain degree, a lot of, um, you know, uh, my, my boss and a lot of people, you know, in that sort of generation were all saying, oh, it's just, it's just a bit of psychosomatic stuff, like, don't worry, or it's just, you know, you just got to puff them up and make them feel feel good about what's going on and that that's what gets people buy in and it's this they're not doing the treatment properly um but when we started looking at the research we started to, well, when i started looking at the research i started to see it's not that that simple that there seems to be many treatments that can work and there not doesn't seem to be one treatment that treats an entire condition plantar heel pain is a classic you know where we see people that come in with uh who are very sedentary um you know 40, what was that thing that we taught in, in university, you know, plantar fasciitis, it's 40, 50s, female, generally a little bit overweight. 
um, as sort of a, a group, but we also then started seeing people who were 20 years old runners, you know, really, really athletic starting to get heel pain. And it just didn't make sense that they were the same condition. So essentially I started to have a lot of questions and where I sort of ended up as a roundabout way was looking into f finding uh, complexity um, in injury prevention literature. And it sort of explained that, that you can have uh, the same condition reached to by many different ways. Uh, and there's many different ways that someone who can have a condition can get better. So again, plantar heel pain, we think, you know, as a conceptual basis, it could be just, you know, we're looking at load management, you know, there's many different ways that we can manage that load, exercise, um, uh, orthotics. Um, it could just be simply uh, reducing running for a short period of time in certain cases. So we started to, I started to really find that incredibly helpful because it, it, rather than seeing patients and looking for one, the exact thing that we needed to do each time, it was about saying, well, actually, if we're looking at the research and we're understanding it and we've got this idea that, that people can, a condition can come about multiple different ways and people can recover multiple different ways, it's about mm -hmm. finding the best path for that patient. All of a sudden, it was incredibly freeing to be able to go, well, I've got all the research is telling me i've got all these different options you know neo a for example classic um recent paper came out saying you can do both high intensity and low intensity exercise for it there is not one that's better even though that that's what the results said but the study still said why would you do high intensity because it had this idea that there is one treatment that's better and if the one treatment that's better if they have the same outcome the better treatment is the one that has the potential for least risk so a lower intensity exercise why would you just do that but to me, it now screams, well, you can do both. If a patient comes in that wants high-intensity exercise, they have knee, no knee osteoarthritis, there's no difference. You can do both and get a good outcome. So for me, it was very freeing. And that sort of approach essentially is what led me to Cause Health. Um, so Cause Health was essentially a finding ways that um, we could explain this to clinicians that was doing research and showing that this is what was happening in the human body, that we need to understand complexity. We need to understand that, you know, when we're looking at heel pain, we can't just uh, look at it and say it's caused by this one thing, which is pronation or caused by this one thing, which was a foot posture. It said it can come, you know, we can get to that by many different means. And, and here's a framework and here's a, a process that we can use to understand that better, that we can apply in clinic, that we can start to, you know, change the way that we think. And in that process, become better, more evidence-based clinicians, especially in a space where we have limited evidence and we need more of that thought process uh, and a framework to sort of get through. So that's sort of my, my story, uh, how, how I got here. And um, yeah, being involved in Cause Health has been fantastic because I get to learn so much stuff from, from some very, very smart people and um, it's been it's just been an incredible help on the on my clinical uh, application of it. Well, I think what you say there, Alec, a lot of things you say. I hope certainly myself as a clinician and many other clinicians listening will will, will that will resonate with them that that those scenarios we have in clinic where things we do that our colleagues do don't we don't seem to get the same outcomes. Those uh, you know, those kind of simple solutions that we're taught or that we hope are, are true um, and that we look for don't seem to be the case. So hopefully that's enough to keep people listening. Rani, can we come to you and, and sort of get your take on a few things? Because we are we are guilty as, as health professionals, podiatrists, I speak, uh, the royal we, um, we are guilty of having a patient, uh, a, human, a human who is an incredibly complex ecosystem present to us in clinic in pain which we now know is an incredibly complex and multifactorial and emergent experience. Yet the patient wants a simple reason as to what's caused my pain. We want to sometimes give them a simple reason. And we are guilty, like Alex says, of saying, oh, your heel pain's because of your pronation or your knee pain's because of your leg length difference. Could you, uh, you know, and go back as far as you need to with regards to sort of schooling us on what, what, what we, how we should reconceptualize causation uh, in, uh, as a concept but could you perhaps guide us as to how we could behave a bit better uh, based on on what what sort of theories we have now around causation or what, what cause health is, is the messages it's trying to put out there yeah yeah thanks thanks griff uh i'm very glad you started with alex because that was a very nice setup <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so in 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 cause health we are working on certain 
concepts, uh, certain types of questions uh, about, for instance, what, what do we mean by cause? When we say, does this treatment work? What does that really mean to work? Um, which treatment works best according to the evidence? Well, works best, uh, what does that mean? And according to what types of evidence? What does evidence, what do we mean by evidence here? And, and when you say that, well, maybe there's a high probability that it's going to work, what do we mean by high probability? Um, does it mean how often something happens elsewhere? Or do we mean how probable it is for you? Do we mean for your subgroup, like uh, being a male, uh, being uh, in this and this age, having this and this diagnosis? So what exactly is it these concepts are supposed to mean? And when we say complex, what do we mean by that? And what can we mean uh, when we talk about complexity and evidence, for instance? Because if you want to be evidence-based, Typically now, in the evidence-based uh, practice framework, it means that it's based on statistical uh, data. So we gather a lot of numerical data uh, from other people. So when you want to know what is best to do here, what's going to work here, you don't look here. You look at the data from other people. So what happens to your patient? It's an anecdote. But what happens to other people in a study? That's evidence. And what we're saying in core self is why? Why is what happening here? What, why is that not uh, interesting evidence uh, about causality? Why is it only evidence if this person is placed in a, in a study? And so, so when it comes to this idea of uh, the cause, the effect, it, I think we are as a society, we are within this type of thinking that there is one cause for each effect and we, it might be the trigger so it might be the last thing that happened it might be the main responsible thing <laughs> so it might not be the trigger because the trigger might be the the straw that uh, broke the camel's back so it might just be the last little thing and the main thing is what happened before but but typically when we have the statistical evidence we will look at one type of intervention and one type of outcome. And then we are not interested in all these different contexts and what they brought with them and what happened in each individual case. We're just interested in the common cause and common effect. So if we did this, how often did we get the outcome that we wanted? And so if, if we think of causation in that sense, it's really not very what we call very deep knowledge of causality because it just tells you how often things happen. So for instance, if I want to know uh, if dropping this pen will cause it to fall, I can of course count how often that kind of thing happens, you know, uh, but it's not like I'm learning anything about the causal relationship. I'm just seeing that repeating this will get me repeated falling. If you, if you want to understand causality, we might think that you should understand under which condition it happens and when it doesn't happen, which, which kind of factors, which kind of properties and, and which kind of contextual factors might counteract the effect from happening. So, so in a clinical study, for instance, yeah, you can just count numbers needed to treat. So maybe it works for seven out of 10 compared to this other treatment that only works for four out of 10. But then the question is, well, the person in front of me, is it going, which of these two are going to work for that person? Maybe none of them. So what is best evidence for this person? So if you look at it from a statistical quantitative point of view, then it's all about finding the perfect subgroup. You know, so it's like, okay, people who are like this person, uh, what happened to them? Um, but you might also think that, okay, so maybe we know something about how the treatment works, how it works and how it interacts with the body. Maybe we know something about what kind of things that would typically hinder it to work. And then we want to find out with this person whether they are the right sort of what we call mutual manifestation partner for this treatment. It's a bit like if you want to give people peanuts, you should first know if they have peanut aller allergy, you know, and if they do, it doesn't, it doesn't help that most people like peanuts and that it's healthy for them. So, so it's about understanding the how and the why we say in cause self. So if you want to really think of cause and effect relationships, the counting might give us an indication of whether you have 
uh, whether something works, but it's not going to teach you anything about why and how it works, which is maybe what you need to know whether it's going to work for this person. And you also need to know who is this person and are they the type of person who this will work for. So it's a bit like, I think it's very common that we think of probabilities and risk in that sense. We look at risk factors. So if I want to know, like, what's the risk of me having a fracture? Um, yeah, you might look at my subpopulation and see, oh, my God, all these people are having fractions all over the place. But I'm just home on my sofa and having a home office. I mean, what on earth is the risk? It's not very high risk at all. But then if I buy a kick bike and take my border collie on the bumpy road down hills, then the risk would increase. <laughs> but But only for me, not for other people, for me. So you see, those are two different ways of thinking of it. It's what happens elsewhere that you can count. And then it's like, okay, but what about me? What about this person? What is it here that can give me a clue? It's two types of causal insights. And I think the fascinating thing there is that in our clinics as clinicians, every clinical encounter we have, every interaction we have with someone who's coming to see us is, is, is an individual, you know, sort of uh, interaction with that, that particular individual. Um, yet we, we, we lean on the evidence base, the population level evidence base to, to inform our decision making. So to, to my mind, the two things that, well, not the two things, but the two main things that we normally like to at least uh, pretend we have a handle on are the, the, the sort of um, factors about that individual that predispose them to injury risk because then we can be so bold as to say that we may be, be able to prevent or, or perhaps reduce their injury risk in the future. Um, so we like to believe that we have a reasonable handle on that. Um, and I'm not sure that we do. And we also, like you've already said, like to believe that when someone comes in with pathology X, that we now know what the things are that, you know, like Alex said, for plantar heel pain, as an example, we know that the tools in the toolbox to reach for because the evidence tells us that, that that will cause pathology X to improve. So uh, but based on all the things you've just said, how do we, how do we, um, <laughs> that's the best, I don't, I'm not even intelligent enough to ask, ask word this question in my head, but how do we take uh, the evidence base and we're not obviously poo-pooing it and we'll come on to talking more about evidence uh, shortly, but how do we take the evidence base alongside it, the context of its limitations and how do we then, answer those kind of questions on that individual one-to-one -one level, if indeed we can. Are you asking me now? Well, Alex, <laughs> feel free to jump in and, and reword that question more intelligently if, if you can. Yeah, I mean, I can, uh... I can say just one thing, because I would say that if that's difficult, it's not the clinician's fault. <laughs> it's the way the whole system is set up to tell you that what works best in a population is what you need, is all you need to know what's going to work for your patient. And I would say that's not true. Not I true. think that, 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 that's, that's exactly the point, that when we look at the evidence, we, let's say we take a, a, an RCT um, and essentially what we do, so I, I'm, I'm always fine when I'm sort of looking at research, I kind of go, okay, so who's the population they test? And they go, okay, so we'll take heel pain. It's it's sort of the, the most common condition that we see. And we go, okay, so who who has heel pain in this study? And they go, okay, it's people from 18 to, you know, 80. So people who can sign the form to say that they, they, they can enter the study and are adults and can make it to the study. So you've got all of these people who huge range, different activities, all these sort of different people that are coming into this one study and – we average all of their results. So what we've got is we've got this average of 40 to 50, because guess what? We had people from 18 to 80. What's the average person that's going to turn up for the study? Probably when we take into account all those outliers, the average is always going to be in the middle. It doesn't accurately tell us who actually has it. It doesn't tell us anything about them. And then what we do is we give them a, a standardized intervention and we then have this outcome, which is, oh, some people got better. Some people didn't. And there's no answer of who got better and why they potentially got better. Um, and what, what we actually do with that information, we only know that, Hey, you know, 50% of people got better with a, with a foot orthotic. And it doesn't tell me anything about that patient in front of me. 
and the mechanism by which the uh, the the photothonic work or the mechanism which it didn't work it doesn't tell me the mechanism of how the condition came about it just tells me that this could work in some people and that's incredibly valuable information i'm never going to say that's not but it's not incredibly valuable information for making a decision on that on whether the patient in front of me gets a photothonic and what we've what we're sort of saying is that we need to get better at looking at that and saying well hold on a second i need to figure out what it the 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 the, the factors of this patient that's going to help them get better and from a clinical perspective that's sort of where potentially clinical experience comes in uh, quite a fair bit in terms of we've now got all of this information out there and we should be searching we should be using these filters on 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 um, evidence and starting to figure out well then how can i take this evidence if this is true that some people are getting better some people are not and understand what's going to happen in my patient so when we we do have a patient that has uh we give them an orthotic and they don't get better we can go well that that does make sense well what other options do we have what other information do we have that that could tell us what could help for this subgroup or this population and if we don't it's then about what systematic approach can we have to treating that person that then can help us figure out what's going to work best for them rather than sort of just saying well this should work because it worked in 80% of people in this RCT, but there's still 20% that don't get better. And I think probably the other big thing is that when we look at most statistical analysis, like we look at the results, they're qualitative measures uh, like, do you think you got better? You know, rate it on a Likert scale. Here's five options. I'm a lot better or I'm a lot worse. or I'm a bit better or I'm a bit worse or no change. And that then becomes a statistic. And that, that then says, well, you know, this works... 80% of the time, because a lot of people turned up and said, well, you know, 80% of people turned up and said, I got a lot better or a bit better, but there's no quantification. It's not actual um, data. So in, in one sense, uh, so, you know, we can look at that and we can just ask our patient, you know, we did something, do you feel a bit better, a lot better? And we can start to, to understand that, yeah, the statistics aren't absolutely set in stone in that sense. It is, they're, they're, they're just asking people and and we what they feel like and we can do that in our clinic as well we can be systematic in terms of asking people okay we've tried this do you feel better do you feel worse how much okay and we can start to use that as a, as a guidance so so sort of treating patients when we don't have a lot of evidence we can sort of treat them as our own little study and, and systematically follow that that approach okay alex look i'm gonna i'm gonna just i, I totally agree with what you're saying but <laughs> um <laughs> there's I'm on, I'm on your side, but a common response, say, from the people who do the research to that kind of argument is, oh, you just don't like the results of this study, so you're going to use the logical fallacy of special pleading to justify not implementing this research into practice. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying I agree with that approach, but that is the response you'll get to those kinds of arguments. So I wonder how you'd respond to that. So... Um, I'd probably say it was, it was interesting. So when we when we did um, a, a, as part of sort of my inter my interviews with with a lot of course health people, Ro Roger Kerry was was at pains to make this point that it's not we're not cause health is not trying to say that um, the, you know choose evidence and say oh this is not important or being anti evidence. Uh, it's more of I would explain it like an expansion, and, and this is what happened when we when we look at the biopsychosocial model of health. Um, exactly the same as all, all, all cause health is trying to say is that we need to expand beyond just this very rudimentary understanding that, that RCTs are the top level evidence. RCTs are, are about stripping everything away. And so you don't get things that essentially could introduce bias. So you don't get bias, but what it does do is it strips away everything that happens in a clinic. So when someone rolls up, there is going to be non-specific effects that are going to affect your results in the clinic. And we need to understand that because that's going to affect your results in the clinic. Um, we can't just look at the RCT on the top of this pie. Now, that being said, are we saying that RCTs are useless? Absolutely not. Are we saying that we shouldn't use them? Absolutely not. They're just only one way of uh, helping us figure out the uh, causation so if we have you know 50 percent of people and, I, and i'm just sort of rounding things here get better from plantar heel pain with an orthotic that's we can't we're, we're in a well well uh, controlled rct 
that's real. That's always real. 50% of people got better with an orthotic. Now what we have to do is we have to understand why. And that might involve doing experiments that have more bias, but are more targeted to certain populations to try and essentially then combine all the knowledge and say, so, so how does this all work? What's the mechanism? So it's not sort of saying, no, this evidence is incorrect and we're just choosing not to apply it. It's saying, how do we actually make this make sense with our population um, so it's taking that evidence and it's taking this framework and saying we need an expansion because this alone doesn't doesn't tell us not that this is wrong. If if that if that sort of answers that that question. Yeah, my, my interpretation of this is is like you say, not poo pooing the evidence, but acknowledging it's acknowledging it in the context of its limitations and what it's the way it's been designed and then layering that on top of like we said the complexity of of the individual human in pain and I've, i listened to that talk of yours alex with roger and and the word he used which i i heard that i've not had before which i i loved was um this concept of clinical freedom in that you know you, you don't get to sort of say this this research this rct is has some limitations therefore i'm going to reach for the crystals i think he said or you know that i'm going to rub horse hair on this tendinopathy it doesn't give you the it doesn't give you the uh the sort of the card that means you can just do whatever you want um but but it's acknowledging those limitations but i wonder if um we could consider the real world scenario where we are a clinician who says okay i embrace all of this but then when we get into our clinic tomorrow morning um you know the one thing that 2020 and all of the things that year threw at us highlighted was that society as a whole uh, doesn't really love living in the gray you know nuance seems to upset society it wants hard fast answers it wants black answers it wants white answers and and there are going to be clinicians probably listening who are saying okay i i i understand all this but when my patients come in they want me to tell them what's caused their problem and they want they want someone to deliver a confident sort of um appraisal of the assessment to tell them this is what's caused your problem and this is how i'm going to fix it and i use that fix in the in the loosest sense of the word um i know you know what i'm talking about here alex and i wonder if maybe alex you could talk through how would the clinician um sort of um tread that line between embracing what what cause health philosophies are but actually the real world scenario where where patients don't seem to want the discussion about you're an individual and this is complex yeah, I, I, well, I think that when you said, you know, patients want to know what the cause is and exactly how we're going to fix it, uh, my first, um, my first sort of response is, 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 do they? <laughs> uh, you know, we, we we see this in the manual therapy debate in in, in physiotherapy, and I'm I'm very careful about about. Tr treading into that debate, um, not being, having any training in manual therapy. Um, and, and that, that means that I can't possibly know what I'm talking about. Um, but there is this idea that patients want to know exactly what's happening and exactly what we're going to do and exactly how we fix it. And I don't think that's exactly true. It would be nice, but I think there's a level of, if we can't have that certainty, do patients really want a false sense of, of, certainty do should we be giving them a false sense if i asked them and i said we have this more nuanced that way we can understand it and i can talk to you about um what we do know i can talk to you about what we don't know i can talk to you about uh the nuance i can talk to you about different options i can help make sense of what each option would mean for your life um i can talk you through all of this and then i can help based on the information that you've given me, help you reach a decision or we can reach a decision together on what we think is the best path forward um, and be aware of the times where we would change that, that, that course that we're choosing based upon the information we get as a result from what we try. And I think patients are going to choose option two. Most of the time when we go, well, I'd much rather someone who talks to me is real with me um, and doesn't give me this false sense of confidence or, or security and just says, look, this is what we're going to do. This is what we can. And I think this is the focus. What can we change? And I think there's a difference between what can, what causes something uh, and what can we change? Because if we look at, for example, the, the paper that really sort of got me interested in complexity, I encourage everyone to read it. It's not cause health. Sorry, Rani. Um, 
is the Bitten Court <laughs> NFN paper. And it and it just it just collates a whole bunch of information about ACL injury risk. And it puts up this big map and it says, well, you know, it's dynamic knee valgus is, is potentially a, a factor, but it's only when you have um hip muscle weakness there's uh, unanticipated environmental effects there's fatigue there's all these sort of things that are uh, in- impacting each other and what the focus really is is saying well you know if someone is in basketball or is in ballet and you know there is no way to completely prevent them from getting an injury but there is what can we control what can we actually modify and change and it's not ascribing causation is in the sense that i'm if i eliminate um this factor you know it's never going to happen again it's just saying that this is something that i can control here's the things that i can't control the fact that um you know you've got this six foot seven you know very large man pelting down a court at you and you could just land funny get knocked over that might cause still cause an injury but it's saying well if we get you strong if we monitor your fatigue levels if we load manage you effectively if we make sure that as a um uh, you know the basketball association that sets the rules ha- takes into account how these rules will affect how people will play and tries to not put them in situations that are high risk of injury um based upon based upon those rules we can actually reduce the amount of injuries and you know being real with people and you know being able to say you know you have an acl injury you are at higher risk of of, a, of another ACL injury, or when we're not going to be able to control these factors. And having that nuanced discussion is much better than just saying, "Right, we've got you strong, off you go." And then when they come back with an ACL injury, they go, "Well, that didn't work." And you say, "Well, it probably worked very well. It's just the fact that you had a six foot seven, very large man run at you, and when you landed, knocked you over, and th- there's your there's your injury again, or you know something happened." That, that you could didn't foresee happening and, and that that's what that's what um put you in a situation where there's no no way you could possibly be strong enough to stop that from happening again yeah rani i'm going to circle back to an earlier point i'm going to put you on the spot a tiny bit can we ever can we ever based on 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 what we talked about and all the things we haven't talked about yet can we ever truly know the causation of something whether it be the the reason someone got injured in the first place or whether it be you know the the effect of of an intervention we gave is can we ever truly know um or is it, is it never going to be that simple do we do we truly ever need to know if we can't so at least uh there will always be things that you didn't know uh if you don't talk to your patient very much then there's a whole bunch of things you don't know that you should be knowing um i would say the kind of knowledge you get in your education is really costly relevant because it tells you how things work, how things work in the body. You know a lot about how things work, but the evidence is not about that. The evidence is about how often something, something, something works, but it's also averaging out that effect. So when when you say that something works best, you mean best on average compared to another intervention and that tells you extremely little so when people say there's no evidence that this works okay what does that mean it means maybe that there is no rcts performed because there couldn't be an rct designed for exactly this kind of thing like for instance nutrition studies so nutrition studies are not that easy to do with rcts uh, because it's not easy to just isolate certain things so you might have to do other types of studies but if you don't acknowledge those kinds of studies you're going to say there's no evidence that which doesn't mean that they're evidence that it's not working. So, but once you say something is evidence, we just have to remember uh, how narrow that is. And I think we are now treating whole populations uh, in standardized ways, according to what works. So, so the kind of um, ethics that we are using now is to do to everyone what works for most. So we kind of sacrifice everyone that it wouldn't work for in the study because it would work for most people. Or a lot of the treatments that we're offering, for instance, in in pharmaceutical um, interventions, they don't work for most people. So some of the most common drugs prescribed, they work for one in 10. So you, you have numbers needed to treat is like 10 people, sometimes 25 people. It means that you give drugs to people who would never benefit 
but in average on the population scale you're at least preventing some people from getting a heart attack for instance so if i want to know if i should give you cholesterol lowering uh, pills i could ask for instance do you have any in your near family who had a heart attack and you can say yeah actually my brother just had one it's like okay then we are going to give you some we will give you some drugs to prevent you from but you're not your brother you're not your uncle you're not your your father you know you might have a completely different lifestyle and a completely different physiology as well but you might get a lot of side effects you might not even have the receptor needed to to benefit from that drug but we still say that this works best and everyone should do it so i think this kind of standardization where we take something that in average is supposed to work and we say do this to everyone it it's really what we're we're maximize we're maximizing utility or benefit on a population level but not for the individual but as a clinician you want to maximize utility or the benefit for your patient and then you cannot i mean necessarily you cannot average them out as a standard uh, or average normal patient. I mean, just because in your study, for instance, if you say people are 20 to 60, that doesn't make you 40. It's just, sorry. I cannot say, yeah, okay, so most likely you're 40. No. <laughs> so it's just, uh, why, why, do we, why do we do it like this? Well, we do it like this because it's easy uh, and time efficient. It's cost efficient. And the people who take the, I mean, the bill <laughs> are the everyone who are in the marginal group or the ones who were not part of the studies or not represented in the studies. So if, if you take everything you learned in your education instead and everything you learn about your patient in front of you, you already have so much causal evidence or so much causal knowledge that it wouldn't count as evidence in the sense because in this type of framework that we are now, the data counts more than theories. So what you understand about mechanisms of the body, they can say, well, you might be wrong, but the data, they don't lie. But the data can still tell you something that is not the full story. And we know that the data doesn't talk about your patient. It talks about other people. I, yeah. I, would, I would jump in here and... and, and make make a, a, a couple potentially a couple of points um one would be there's a there's a really really good book um called medical nihilism um by jacob i think his name's stranger something Stegen. something yeah yeah that one Stegen. um <laughs> but he makes he makes a point and and sort of what what the whole and, I, and this isn't a I, I haven't actually talked to Rani about this. I'm not sure whether she'll, she'll agree. So what I'm saying is not representative of course health, um, but it's sort of this approach and saying, if, if you read all the evidence that's out there and you really understand it and you really understand what it's trying to do, you would come to the conclusion that we really don't know what's going on. We actually really don't have a lot of evidence to put trust in science and say science has all the answers. And I think that's, that's, the, that's sort of where I've ended up where – if we have this understanding that that science doesn't have the answers, it's just a process and it helps us understand things as best as we possibly can. And we're not saying that it's not real. It's just saying there's a lot of gaps in, in what we have and we, we can't just apply things carte blanche. We can't just say this is the result and this is what's going to happen to everyone on the population-based study. We say we've got this wonderful information, but there's so many different gaps. How do we make sense of this and how do we help people in you know that come into our clinic make sense of this that's our role that's clinical experience that's what we should be doing um but it's also not saying that evidence is bad if anything you know what, what jacob says in his book is he says it's it's a it's a shot against all of the people that are applying quack medicine or, or not being having ev any evidence at all it's not saying open the floodgates let anything in it's actually saying this is more of a reason we need to be incredibly judicious with what we're doing to patients because the things that we are taught are positive may not be as positive for the patient in front of us as we think based upon these studies. So we have to be incredibly careful and what evidence we have to, we have, we have to apply it, you know, really judiciously think about it. You know, wh what is it doing exactly for who, why thinking about those, those sort of studies, because 
other you know we you know science doesn't have the answers and we can't say anything carte blanche so i think that's that's sort of a big point um there's also a really sort of great example uh, that we used um in our sort of course health series of um a guy on twitter actually who i think it was tiktok um i'm already scarily that that old that i that i'm struggling to tell the difference um <laughs> And he was a guy and he put up this video and he just sort of said, you know, the, the health insurance company has flagged me as potentially malnourished based upon, you know, his, his weight. And it's a video of him in a mirror. And so they sent, he said, they sent this nurse over and he said, and the nurse was like, I think you're potentially malnourished. And he was like, I think we can agree. There's a better explanation. He was missing his whole leg from his hip. And... <laughs> And so, the, you know, they're just going through this questionnaire and she was going, no, this, this works really, really well. You know, oh, we've identified you as potentially malnourished, but the nurse had was just constantly going through these questions of, you know, what are you eating? What are you doing? You know, and it was just blatantly obvious that what, what, what was going on was he was just missing a leg that's like, you know, 30% of your body weight or 25% of your body weight. Uh, but that was the system, the system said, you know, the nurse was like, well, I have to fill in this paperwork. You've been identified as potentially malnourished. So we have to do this questionnaire, despite the fact it was very clear that he wasn't now malnourished. And I think that's a really apt sort of way of explaining, I think, what sort of happens sometimes with our patients where, you know, they come in and they, and, and, you know, we're identifying these factors and we're saying, this is a potentially, you know, what's going on. And this is potentially something that's happening. And we're not, we, we run the risk of if we just look at the evidence and say, well, you know, this is exactly who gets the problem and this is exactly, you know, what we're going to do for it. We end up with false understanding. So my, you know, experience was always, you know, if someone's coming in with heel pain, they're generally 40 to 50 and they're, they're a woman and that, cause that's what the data tells us. Um, but it's the average data. So I was very confused when I started seeing people in their twenties and I was thinking, geez, you know, something must be really going on here, weird or wacky or something. And the more that, that I practice, the more I realized, well, actually, no, there, there is just a, a spectrum. You know, there is just a huge spectrum that, and, and the average result was exactly like Rani said, someone who came in when he was 20, someone who came in who was 60 and we, and the study saying 40, you know, that's, that's the person who gets it. Let me, at the risk of bleating on about heel pain, even more than we already have, I'm just going to mention a, a paper that we recently published and get both of your takes, not on the paper, but on the response to the paper from clinicians. Alex, I know you know this paper already, but it was a paper, um, uh, looking at how to treat heel pain, the best practice uh, for heel pain. Um, and it sort of took three a three-pronged approach, I think, to try and minimise the limitations of just a good old-fashioned systematic review. But it did a systematic review where it looked at all of the research uh, historically that, that um, looked at the things that work, in inverted commas. I'm nervous about saying that, Manmani, but the things that work for heel pain. It then asked a load of the world's experts the things that in their hands that they feel work best. And then it got the patient perspective, uh, sufferers of heel pain, and asked them what, what things do they think work. And it tried to bring all of these three tenets together and sort of synthesize it all. And what came out was a, was, was a guide on the things that might be worth considering and at what stage. Now, the interesting thing I think was, uh, Craig's pulling up here, the interesting thing I think was um, that the response from from clinicians, from, from, you know, people who treat heel pain again, and I'm not talking about letters to the editor here. I'm talking about, um, tweets, uh, you know, the, the 2021 version of the letter to the editor. If you've got a problem with the paper now, you, you just tweet it, don't you? Um, but interestingly, the things that weren't particularly, didn't come out as particularly favorable, that there was poor, um, poor suggestions of or poor levels of evidence for, um, if people were already doing those things, in clinic, so the big one being strength work, um, another thing being things like class four laser. People are doing those things in clinic. They are seeing um, what they believe are positive effects from those interventions, i.e. It, it, it works for me kind of uh, anecdote. Um, they were very, very happy to read that paper and say, oh yeah, but they, they, they left out strength work or they left out laser. It, it didn't really massively influence their practice. Now, based on the things we've said about sort of things working on an individual level, where, where do we sit with that? At what point do we, at what point do we say, okay, if you are, if an individual in a clinic is getting patients better, is that just okay, whatever they decide to do? And at what point do we have to flag that some clinicians in some corners of the globe might be doing all sorts of 
all sorts of crazy stuff um, under that guise. I, ho I hope I've worded that question reasonably. Was did, that did you... my was that my <laughs> my challenge? <laughs> oh, yeah, I was going to say, Ronnie, do, do, do you want me to to jump in and then you can you can sort of pick up the the, pe the, yeah. the pieces? Anything yeah. I missed? Um, I think it was an incredibly good paper. Um, because it, it, but I think the 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 interesting thing was the limitations. So, for example, strength work was an interesting one, and and correct me if I'm wrong. You know, being being an author, um, w uh, the the issue with strength work was it wasn't the studies done enough to be able to say. Um, and I think the, one of the biggest sort of things that came out was the amount of studies that were done on shockwave. Um, and I think that that was the that that's a very interesting sort of point where we're saying you know part of the the issue that we run into is that things just might not be studied, and that's not saying that oh no, but I, I think everyone should get strength work, um, and it just hasn't been studied, and and you know I'm I'm doing you know God's work, you know giving everyone strength work, um, and, and the studies will come. It's it's sort of saying that there's there's that there's that limitation that comes into it, and. I thought it was a really good paper because it came out with some guidelines and said, well, here's the evidence that, w that we have that says these are the things that work. So when we you did, did look at the um, shockwave and then said, well, actually, it has all these results, but stretching seems to, to be the, the go-to thing. Even though this has all these positive effects, stretching still seems to be the thing that, that is the, the better, most cost-effective thing to do to start off with. Um, and, and this sort of information is incredibly helpful in terms of providing a core approach. So saying, you know, stretching and taping seems to be the core and then figuring out what's going to work best for the patient. You know, is it going to be pain education? Is it going to be orthotics? Is it going to be um, something else? And this is what the evidence that we do have. Um, and when we start to understand the nuance, you can start to understand where you, what you can do. So for a classic sort of example in, in defensive of sort of strength in a way, if someone wants to run, if someone wants to jump, if someone wants to do activities, if they've never jumped before and they're not trained and they don't have the ability to jump or the strength to do it, they won't be able to jump and won't be able to get back to their activity. Where we're probably looking at the literature at the moment is that, you know, there isn't enough evidence to say that that's potentially going to have a whole effect. So if you, if you have someone that comes in and you, you know, we can, reason out and say well here's the core approach we should be probably taping you we should be um getting you to stretch and then what else can i add on top of that what what's going to make sense to you and someone who's 50 that works in retail stands on their feet all day it's probably not going to you know if i'm thinking about strength work i'm thinking about well you know what's the benefit to that person and we don't have the evidence to say that's going to be helpful so we can ask them we can consult them we can talk to them and say you know is this something that we want to apply or is this something that we don't and compared to something when we say taping or we say stretching we say this is the thing that we know is really quite helpful and effective um, when we have someone who's coming in that's a runner um, and there's potential other benefits of strength work and just using this as an example um showing my strength coach um background um there's some other benefits of strengthening there. And we say, well, this might be a useful adjunct that if we're thinking about you no longer running, if we're thinking about you no longer doing the sport of choice, can we keep you active and moving? Can we apply this in such a way that, you know, get you training that, that doesn't aggravate your pain? And is there some benefits from that? Now, if you say, I've been doing all these exercises and suddenly my heels, heels a lot, pain's a lot better, we don't have the evidence to say, oh, it was strength work that did it, but we sort of created a plan that said, well, we taped you, we strapped you, we gave you this strength work, we gave you a guidance on how to keep moving as best you can to try and get the best outcome. We applied these things for these reasons. You seem, you, you, you got better, perfect. We created a, a nuanced plan, but we can't then say that everyone who comes in, that's going to work for them. We have to go through that reasoning process for each individual and also that, that consultation process of, well, these are the things that work. These are the things that I think would be helpful for you, either for your pain or for other reasons. Um, you know, what, what makes sense to you? And then when they go and do it and they say, wow, this, this, these exercises are really, you know, giving, making my pain worse. Well, this is, this is their, their experience. We go, let's change that. You know, what, what evidence, you know, tells us is that, well, you know, strength work isn't, you know, 
incredibly evidence based, and you're saying it's it's irritable, was well, irritating you. Well, let's let's pull that back. Rani, I've thought of a slightly different way to word this before I get your take on this same thing as well. So rather than t- talking about the, the the mechanism of effect of the intervention per se, I really want your, your thoughts on the the philosophy or the, the thinking behind at what point, like Alex says, we're not picking on strength particularly, but we'll, we'll use that as an example. At what point do we say, okay, strength doesn't have much evidence, but I'm going to apply alongside my clinical reasoning clinic. Uh, it, it, at what point do we accept that, but we perhaps don't accept someone saying, okay, the next person who comes in with heel pain, I'm going to gently pour some horse's urine onto it. Um, you know, it has an equal level of evidence per se. It, is it the biological plausibility? Like, uh, where I, I guess what I'm asking is, where's the philosophical line between people doing things that, that technically don't have an evidence base and that being accepted and doing things that don't have an evidence base and that being demonstrably pseudoscientific? So you could have evidence for something that you don't believe in at all and which probably you shouldn't believe in if there's no plausible mechanism, no plausible scientific uh, explanation for it. For instance, I think it was a um, British medical journal who has this uh, satirical number issue uh, before Christmas and someone uh, wrote a paper on an RCT that was done on uh, prayers that was working backwards in time. So they took, uh, they took a patient group in a hospital from the 50s or 60s or something. They randomized them and they did a prayer for the test group and they didn't for the control group. And then they checked and they saw that the people they prayed for actually had recovered uh, better. So they published this. And it was done in all the right ways that would normally count as very good evidence. And it was a very good statistical difference maker. So it, it, it did work. Uh, but of course, no one really believes that praying for someone in the past <laughs> uh, would make them recover in the past. So um, why don't we then say, OK, but here's the evidence you better accept it. I mean, so, so yeah, you can say, oh, yeah, people believe all sorts of bullshit. But yeah, you can, you can prove all sorts of bullshit. <laughs> it's not the problem. So what people started doing was to question the RCT. And they said, oh, he didn't randomize uh, properly. It wasn't enough people. And they said, well, actually, it was more people than normally in an RCT. And I did it all according to everything. Uh, so I think that people have and should have more reasons to accept or reject evidence than that there is an RCT uh, being f- performed. And of course, there's this other satirical paper about why uh, there's no evidence. So there's no evidence because there were no, someone did a meta study, uh, systematic review over checking whether parachutes um, pr- uh, prevent um, injury from uh, fall from tall heights uh, and there were no RCTs so there was no evidence so he said it's only anecdotal that we believe that people should wear a parachute so you shouldn't you should never recommend that as an intervention because we lack the evidence in, in Norway so this is not this is not a, a mock example but in Norway the public health institute uh, they have not recommended wearing masks uh, because they said there's no evidence there's no evidence that they work. But of course, mechanistically, we know how masks work. You know, so why don't we use them? Well, because they wanted to see RCTs. Um, so it just shows, you know, it, it limits so much your causal evidence. And I also remember talking to someone who said, if I saw, I mean, I could see as many RCTs as, as possible showing that homeopathy works. I would never, I would never conclude that it could work because it doesn't have a plausible mechanism so you you see my point it's not about just accepting blindly whatever an rct could possibly show you because an rct all it shows you is that between two groups that are supposedly similar there is a difference in the outcome that is statistically significant it doesn't say anything about causation 
I mean, all it shows is that you have these two different groups. But in each of those groups, you just have correlations. So you compare two sets of correlation data where you have something present and where you don't have it. I mean, if you want to understand causation, you better have a mechanism. You better have a reason to say that this is linked to this. Because otherwise, you have all these spurious correlations that you talked about. Nick, uh, you Nick know, Nick Lewis. <laughs> yeah, new films. I mean, why, why was that funny? I mean, you have the data. You have the evidence. Mm, why, why shouldn't we trust it? So Tyler Vegan, I think that's his. That's uh, it, yeah, that's, it, that's yeah. the website. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's full of these uh, almost perfect correlations and we just laugh. But if those correlations were plausible, we would say that there's so strong evidence. And it's so interesting to hear you say it because in the world of podiatry, at least, um, we've historically been, been, been sort of trained to think that the RCT is king, that, 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 that quantitative data is king. And clearly, you know, when we have these really controlled, standardized groups that with all these exclusion criteria and then we, we, we do this, uh, you know, we would always favor that as, as a level of evidence above, say, an N equals one qualitative thematic analysis case study. Um, is the answer that we need more of the latter in, in the research world? You know, for example, let's talk about things like foot orthoses, the things we put in people's shoes, very little qualitative work there, all quantitative. Would we learn more, is one of the solutions here um, to, to, to learn more about causation and understand mechanisms better, to do more sort of individual level studies, more qualitative work, or is it not that simple, uh, Rani? Well, they didn't used to do a lot of RCTs in, in physics or uh, in biology. I mean, this is, <laughs> this, uh, this epidemiological uh, methodology, I mean, it is fairly new. Uh, it used to be, if you, if you think of, uh, if you think of uh, physics, which is where we usually look to when we think of causation and probability, uh, it's usually done under some kind of normal or ideal conditions, and it's purely theoretical. So the law of gravitational attraction, I mean, it would, it works in some ideal. Uh, setting with very closed conditions and then we're out in the real messy world and and none of the laws really apply so simply uh, in the clinic we know that everyone's different but we still try to find these law like under some ideal conditions things that we can implement to each and every one and and i would say that kind of goes against even the scientific ideal that we're we're trying to match it you know, because we know that uh, we know that the real life complexity that you cannot just automatically predict what's going to happen based on what happens under the ideal conditions. And in biology as well, what happens in the lab is not what happens out in the real world. What you do in molecular biology and in ecology are quite different. Uh, kinds of models that you use even to understand. In ecology, you have to think of the whole context because it is an open system. And what, one thing that we say in Core Self is that if we want to be biomedical in our, in our thinking, well, why, why should we learn from ecology instead of molecular biology? Why shouldn't we learn from something where you have nonlinear uh, processes in open systems and some kind of unpredictability uh, you know, or where everything is extremely sensitive to contextual uh, differences. So if you, if you think of a human as an ecosystem, we know that there are going to be more influences than just what's here and now or one factor and one intervention. It's going to be like whatever you change in that context might influence something. So, and that might be a good thing because it means that there's more than one ways to, one way to, to enter intervene and uh, it's more than one explanation um, so yeah that that kind of gives you the complexity and it also gives you the kind of context sensitivity that we are very keen to emphasize and once you have this kind of open system and vast complexity you wouldn't assume that what happens in one case could ever be repeated in exactly the same way and that's also why 
with the RCTs, it's not like you have ideal conditions, but you kind of you use the randomizations to get sufficiently equal settings. But actually, what you're having is a whole bunch of unique settings and a whole bunch of unique responses, and then you average them out and you look at the statistical difference making because you might think if something works, it makes a difference to you. But in the RCT, you're not showing that it makes a difference to the individual. You shows that it makes a difference on the statistical level. So what happens to each and every one is not what it shows. And, 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 and that's two different concepts of difference making in, in the philosophy of causation. You know? Lovely. So I know Craig, I can see Craig fidgeting and that's because we've, that's you know, I've actually, we've, uh, we've just hit well, the actually, hour. I'm I'm happy just to go a little bit over. We, we might just have to go to two well, parts. I was but... I was actually saying I was just actually thinking that if anyone is watching live, I don't know if they've got any questions, Craig, but uh, probably not because um, yeah. they probably like me just feel like they need a bit of a lie down. At this point, I wanted to make sure everyone was aware <laughs> that um, the, the the best thing to do if you want more on this, and Craig's put the links below, is to uh, get download the free Cause Health uh, book, the free ebook. And get yourself onto uh, Dr. Oliver Thompson's Words Matter podcast. And essentially, for every chapter of the book, there is an episode of the podcast. And certainly, the way I did it was I read the chapter, I listened to the podcast associated with that chapter on my run that day, and then I read the chapter again, and then I moved on to chapter two. Now, I'm not saying I understand it, as my uh, below average questions here uh, will uh, are evidence of. Um, but Oliver Thompson is far more intelligent than me, so he asks far better questions than me. So I, I really encourage people if they want more to, to get over to the links that Craig's linked below. Also link on a, a link to, to Alex's Podiatry Systems education website, which I highly recommend. Um, and there's loads of stuff on there alongside Cause Health. I believe I'm right in saying, Alex, that is free as well. Not all of the stuff on there is free, but I think the Cause Health module is free. Is that right? Yes. So I, I, I would say if, you, if you're not, if you're sort of not sure the the what we've what our, our sort of free sort of uh, uh, course with Cause Health is kind of the the Oliver Thompson light. Um, <laughs> I don't know it, what that it, makes me today. Then the, the light, light, maybe. <laughs> well, it, it's it's all it's all about it's it's all just about how much we introduce and and how clinically relevant we make it as well. I mean, Oliver Thompson does a does a fantastic podcast where really really dives deep, really really understands things conceptually um but there is a little bit more of a leap to to the clinic where we're, we're trying to to make it really really clinically relevant everything that we say is 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 something that you can do yeah and i've watched that and it's very podiatry uh, focused with alex being a podiatrist so i highly recommend it um craig any questions or or is it time for us all no to i haven't but no but i, I, I do room. have i do have one question now i'm, I'm not disagreeing with any, anything that's being said but um yeah oh, he always does look this. the, the <laughs> The now this is not me talking. This is what other people would probably say. Um, the the I, I, what what I what I fear is that people will use this kind of information to dismiss the results of a study that goes against their preconceived biases. You know, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing, and they're going to use all this information to dismiss the results of the study, and and that's a fear I have that that. And this is a tactic we've seen since day one. So I just wonder how you'd respond to those kinds of um, uses of this information to, to justify preconceived biases because they don't like the results of a particular study um, that might prove what they're doing is wrong. What you believe has has no impact on on science. It's always the, the thing that I always think of it, that um, oh, I've forgotten the, the, the physicist's name, the the he said that but yeah science doesn't care and so just because you don't agree with the result doesn't mean it doesn't exist what we're sort of saying is is we're we're just encouraging people to think better and say well how does this fit how does this result fit within what happens so if someone's disagreeing with the result and saying that's not real or that's not true it's kind of missed, it's completely missed the point um which is it's more about figuring out how this is true and why this is why this is true and thinking through okay so who what population it is what's the mechanism because at the end of the day if someone wants to argue that well you know foot orthotics don't work for 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 heel pain well we've done an rct that says that they they do what we don't see is 
who they work for. So if you're in a population and you're saying in my clinical experience, they don't work. And we say, well, we can understand that. We can actually say, yeah, you know, there is a whole bunch of people this doesn't work for, and you're probably seeing a whole bunch of them, but we've got to understand that over here, there's a whole bunch of people who are getting better. So we need to understand that difference more, understand why, why that's the case. So I mean, people are always going to disagree and I don't think there is actually one system of saying, you know, this is a verifiable claim. This is not a verifiable claim. The whole idea is we're saying that there's different ways to think about it. And I think what we're seeing where people go, but I'm seeing a result and the evidence doesn't show it is really actually why I think cause health and these ideas are, are, are much more um, needed because, you know, people have had experiences, are having experiences where the RCT says this should work and in their reality, they're seeing it's not work and they're left by themselves going, well, what do we do next? Because if I want to be evidence-based, I have to do it. You know, I have to do what this study says and this, and I've done what this study says and it doesn't work. Where do I go? And so I think where Cause Health sort of fits is sort of saying, you know, and these sort of ideas is if we understand what we're doing, why we're understanding mechanisms and we're understanding that, um, you know, there isn't just one cause and effect. There isn't just one answer and the answer he's going to give it. We've got this freedom, but we've still got this limitation of, you know, biological plausibility. We've still got this limitation of, well, the, the studies have shown this, we understand where there's freedom, um, and where we are helping patients make it, make a decision, um, so I'm, I'm thinking sort of in terms of um, if we're deciding whether to do um, like, let, let's say, for example, laser or not on, on someone's condition, whether it's a, it can be effective anecdotally, but then if we look at an RCT and someone's done a um, RCT and it says, well, there's no difference between the placebo and the, the, the actual um, laser treatment we sort of go, well, there, there's not a, we're not seeing any difference, we're not seeing anything happen. So if we see it work in the clinic, what's the likelihood that it's um, actually doing something that's different? Well, it's probably there's not enough there to support it. But if we've got a, um, you know, RCT for taping, for um, foot orthotics, for other things, and it's effective, we can probably say, well, you know, we can, we can do this a bit more. Who does it work for though? We, we shouldn't be doing carte blanche. Everyone, we should be trying to figure out and, and get that, figure out who is it is, is going to benefit most from it, but also understand that not everyone needs it to get better either. So it's that more nuanced, but people can argue for anything. It's just whether it can be dismissed easily or not. Yeah, and also there's not just one single uh, scientific method. There are many different methods, but in evidence-based medicine, there's, it's it's almost uh, like we pretend there is only one valid uh, type of method. And uh, what we're trying to say is that the different methods show different things. It's not, I mean, ideally you could do the same kind of intervention study with lots of different methods and they would all point in the same direction, but they wouldn't because uh, sometimes uh, you can find something that makes a difference statistically, but uh, maybe you don't find um, that there's very clear, maybe you have something that makes a difference for an individual, but there is no correlation studies to back it up, for instance. Maybe sometimes you have a plausible mechanism, but no RCT will back it. So you have to know which kind of, which kind of method do you trust more. But if you can be more transparent about what the methods are capable of showing you, uh, that would be better because then you could say, okay, so there is no evidence of a mechanism, but we have statistical evidence that seems to give us a correlation or there seems to be a statistical difference maker, uh, then we might be able to weigh and think, okay, actually I got quite a plausible mechanistic understanding and I know that they couldn't do an RCT easily with this kind of, inter with this kind of intervention. So um, I have some reason to do it like this, but we, we, we have a scientific community. It's not like the individual who decides what is scientific. Uh, it's the community that decides. What has been frustrating, I think, is that uh, there's a lot of interventions that the community claims work. But then once you say that the only thing that works is what can be proven by an RCT and has actually been proven by an RCT, then suddenly a lot of interventions don't seem to work, but they work in the clinic. So, so are you going to dismiss them? 
so for instance, in psychotherapy, uh, when they when they look at RCTs and they test, you know, psychological intervention, so therapy as if it was a pill, um, with an RCT, then it seems like only cognitive behavioral therapy works and nothing else. So then they say, okay, everyone has to use cognitive behavioral therapy on all patients because it's the only thing that works. But as a community, they don't agree. So, so that's the frustration that you have like one kind of standard that should fit everything um, while you might have. And it's the same thing if, you are, if you're a teacher in the school and someone decides that everyone should use the same teaching method on all students and they should use that teaching method that works in average for most. And then you put everyone in front of a screen uh, to work with their iPad, which they do in Norway. And as a teacher, you might say, well, for this, for this student, it doesn't work because it's very hard for them to sit and stare at the screen all day. You know, and you have reasons to say that, but actually it's like, no, no, you have no evidence to show that. Mm but you have a full understanding because you're trained as a teaching and educator. So, so it's just about saying that the profession as a whole, they have knowledge that cannot necessarily be backed up with statistics. And I would say that that kind of knowledge that you get from clinical experience and from your, from your science education, because you have a science education, which is not just counting stuff. Uh, that, that is knowledge, that is causal knowledge. And it should count as it. And it's nice if it's backed up by some statistical evidence. Um, and it's nice to be informed by the statistical evidence. But it shouldn't be like only one of these things get all of the say. So there's a lot of individualization there. And I think, you know, a really difficult one whenever I look at studies doing like, for example, a strength intervention, we run into the same thing that, you know, if you've got 100, 200 people and you're giving them the exact same exercise in the exact same dose, um, exact same or intensity, um, it's it's hard because, you, you know, when we do an ex exercise intervention, we're going to individualize it for their sport, for their activity, what they want to do, what they want to get out of, what they're capable of, what their history is. Um, you know, you're not going to give an 80-year-old a standing calf raise on the edge of a block and get them to do 15 reps. Um, but at the same time, I'm also not going to give a 22 year old elite marathon runner, you know, three sets of 10 in exactly the same setup. They, they need different things. And that's something that can't be captured in an RCT because we have to homogenize the, the treatment to, to make it the same for everyone, to make it applicable, to make it prone to less bias. And so we can sort of say, and, and, and this is, you know, what, what I look at when I'm, when I'm training people as well as where I'm applying strength work to their, their treatment. Cause we're sort of going, I'm individualizing this for this person, for what they want to get out of it. And that's based upon my knowledge, the biological plausibility, applying all these studies that say, you know, if we want to get this person better, we have to progressively overload their capability. So what they currently do, we've got to push it by X amount beyond that. And then they're going to adapt. Um, and that's how we're going to get them better. Um, so we can sort of understand that we can apply that and go, well, there's not a lot of evidence for, 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 for how people get stronger and what that, what that effect is, but we can still apply it individually. Uh, it's just about being careful in terms of the causal, what causal relationship we say that if I get you stronger, you'll be better. Cause we don't see that. We see people who are very strong, get, get, get in pain and injury. We see people who are, um, you know, don't have much strength, not get pain or injury. Um, it's, it's not, it's not, it's just about being careful with our thinking and what we're getting and being very um, judicious in terms of the reasoning why we're explain what why we're applying that as well. And you know, so the reasoning that, that I'll add it for a lot of people is that if you want to play sport, you want to get better, you know, and you're not currently playing, we need to add this. We need to do this. Is this will this help your pain? I don't know, maybe, maybe. And that's why we're going to apply it. And that's why we're going to individualize it. Um, but it's it, it's not sort of saying, hey, you know, we've got this person who's come off the field and we've given them a whole bunch of strength work and they're just, they're perfect now. They've gotten completely better than it must have been the strength work. It might have been the fact that they weren't on the field. They might have been not playing for a period of time and um, the strength work just maintained their, their capability. There's all these sort of other explanations and you know, where we get to is sort of not saying, 
you know, this was the reason why it's just about thinking. We can say, well, we can do this. We can, we've logically think this through. This is the, the best plan that we've got based on the evidence. This is what the patient agrees with. This is how we're going to approach this problem. Let's see the outcome. And then we go, that was a good outcome, but we're, we might not always be able to say that's what it is. And I think that's where we start to get into trouble is when we have them, people get up and say, well, I've strength trained everyone with heel pain and they all got better and it's like there's so much more nuance there and when we don't accept the nuance and i think that's always going to be the critique going back to to craig your critique that's always going to be the thing is that there's if we're following this process there's always going to be able to critique okay so what's the mechanism what's the this what what how does this all fit together and we can very easily dismantle those arguments using the exact same tool that people are saying that allows them to make that argument in the first place I've got one last question, if I may, Craig, if that's right, um, before, before we go. Um, and it, it might be might be a bit of a stinker, Rani, but I asked you earlier, um, can we ever truly know the cause of, of something and do we need to? Just to sort of slightly flip that question around, it, does everything have a cause? Um, and we, we, we think of, I think of the chapter in your book, uh, one of your books and uh, the Cause Health one, and I think of this, this, the, the podcast I listened to about sort of, idiopathic or medically unexplained symptoms you know in in medicine we sometimes say to people uh, you know there's no reason why you're doing this you know you, you've got something and we can't explain it medically but is it the case that some things can't have a cause or does everything have a cause and that just means we we don't know what that cause is so it depends on the definition of the cause uh, which is uh, the point of that uh, because we have a chapter uh, called um, when a cause cannot be found and uh, and and this was the this was the starting point for cause health was that uh, we started with these uh, so-called medically unexplained symptoms, which is like thirty to fifty uh, percent of all the complaints taken to the doctor cannot um, they haven't found the cause. And then we thought, okay, so what does it mean that they haven't found the cause? Does it mean that it's caused by nothing? Because in philosophy, that's almost absurd to say that something happens, but not because of anything. And, and what it meant was that they cannot statistically back up that the same thing has happen happened to enough people in a group that you could say that you have same cause, same effect. So for instance, then low back pain, uh, non-specific low back pain came up. Uh, because some people might get low back pain from lifting something or bending down, but there's no uh, RCT showing that when people bend down or lift something up, they get chronic back pain. So everyone seemed to have different types of causes. And according to one definition of a cause, uh, which is the one that we, we use in, uh, in evidence-based medicine, where you should have same cause, same effect over same conditions, if you cannot find the same cause, if you cannot repeat something and see the same thing happening, then you cannot say that it's causal. But of course, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the way that we think about it, we would say that uh, any kind of effect is a manifestation of some properties interacting. So those properties must have been there. But if those properties were unique, so for instance, if someone gets a very rare side effect from a medicine, uh, because they have a very rare genetic setup or a very rare genetic condition, it shouldn't depend on someone else having exactly that kind of genetic setup or genetic condition, whether that could be caused. But when it comes to what we can know, we would say, how could we ever know that this caused the side effect in this case if we don't have any other evidence? So that's the difference you see between was it caused and how can we know that it was caused by exactly this? So in evidence-based medicine, if you cannot know it because you cannot count it by repetitions, then it does not count as a cause. But from a dispositionalist perspective, we would say clearly they had some properties that were unique. We don't necessarily know what those properties are, but it's something we can try to find out. Um, so yeah, in, in philosophy, uh, you would say that everything normally you would say everything uh, that happens would have a cause some people would say this is like a basic uh basic claim except for god who is supposed to be the uh the first cause but yeah but uh, david hume he said that the, um, the creation of the universe if it happened only once it cannot have been caused because 
then we would have had to see repetitions. It would have to happen many times. So we could see it, but it's the same thing happened again. Perfect. So before we go, could I, could I ask you both to um, perhaps give some recommendations to our listeners, if indeed we still have, have any? <laughs> I, don't know if, I don't know how many people are dialed in. Oh, no, there's still, still quite a few there. <laughs> well, that's, good. that's lovely. Uh, I'm glad it's not just me that finds this, this, this kind of stuff equally fascinating and intimidating. And I think that's a, a, a good place to hang out sometimes. Um, what are your recommendations, I guess, Randy, from a, from, a, from a scientific research, a philosophical point of view, and, and Alex, from a clinician point of view, what are, your, what are your recommendations to our listeners that this may be completely new to this evening? Where do, where do they take this information they've just listened to, the thoughts that they may have spiralling around their head when, when, they, um, when they're lying in bed tonight? Where, where, where do they go with this, other than obviously the, the resources that we've signposted? What, what would you say, I'll start with you, Alex, um, to the clinicians out there that may be just going, kind of, okay, okay I've got I've got a full list starting 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Um, does this change my practice tomorrow? I I think the the biggest thing is is freedom, and and, and I say that um, wearingly, knowing exactly what what Craig said because that that is the criticism. But it if all all of if we're taking these sort of ideas, we understand that immediately we don't if we don't have one cause one effect that people can get a condition by many different ways as well as get better many different ways it gives us the freedom to be able to say well we've got these options we've got a number of different things that we can do and that when we talk with a patient it's about figuring out what's going to work best for them so we've got you know, for, for any sort of condition where we're going to have a number of different things that we can do. And it's not about figuring out what's the best overall. It's what's figuring out what's the best from the patient. So that'd be number one. Number two, the patient is the source of information. And if we're viewing our role as always providing the right answer, um, we're going to be setting ourselves up for failure. So the big thing I think is going to then be saying, well, if we take a more nuanced approach and say to pay and, and, explain what we know, explain what we don't know to patients. We set them up and we set their expectations correctly. We can start to apply treatments. And when they come back and say, this didn't work or this worked in this way, that's information that's relevant to us. And we can take that in and we can say, let's make sense of this. And then we can find the result. So the the answer is always going to be a, more of a back and forth between us and the patient than it is providing the answers. And that's incredibly freeing as well. When all of a sudden you don't have to know everything, you just have to be the, the person that guides someone through their treatments, I think would be a big one. When we're reading research, try and understand the mechanisms, read about, you know, who's getting the, 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 the treatment, what exactly the treatment is, and think about it a little bit more in terms of mechanisms and understanding the population and who it applies to is another one. So then we can have a more nuanced understanding of, well, you know, do I just give an orthotic for heel pain or is am I giving an orthotic for heel pain in this type of population with this type of thing? And um, I think probably the, 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 the practical example, you know, and I'm reading this in, in a few studies, like with patellofemoral um, pain is that you can trial things and you can, do things in the clinic and this sort of probably links more to point two like for example you know if, if you're not sure if someone's going to get an orthotic in patellofemoral pain there's a study that says put tape on them and get them to do a single leg squat does that help their pain or not and i think we get too wrapped up in, in looking for an answer um straight away or, or being the person that has the answer straight away that looks at it and says yes rather than being someone who says well i'm not this is what i'm not sure about let's try and test it and i think that's starting to come out um, now in some of these studies in, in picking who might, might benefit from our, from our treatments and who doesn't. So yeah, that, that would be, uh, my, my advice. And I think that that can be applied from tomorrow. It doesn't mean that it has to be, you, you're blowing everything out. It just means, you know, st uh, straight away, start small, start thinking about why am I applying this treatment? You know, is what, what's the mechanism we think it's working in? Is that relevant to this person? What is their result? start start thinking about it slowly and i think you know we'll find very quickly you'll start to make realizations um quite quickly yeah i love it basically embrace the complexity and be transparent and read uh, was it, i think it was matt lowe's episode or chapter about shared decision making and things um so yeah i love that stuff uh, ronnie um we you've done a, a beautiful job of 
basically serving up philosophy to an audience of clinicians and podiatrists. Uh, we sort of tricked people into listening to philosophy. Now, if what would your what would your sort of um, recommendations be for people who want want more, um, but want more as it applies to healthcare, which I know is your, your specialist area anyway. Um, so, of course, um, look at our webpage, callshealth.org. Uh, we have uh, we have started like we did with uh, Alex to make a lot of uh, different resources, educational resources. And um, I was going to answer the first question, because what would you do tomorrow? I mean, we, we have T-shirts with slogans. So we boiled the whole cause health uh, idea down to one slogan. One size does not fit all. So the whole point is that is the right thing to do the same thing to everyone, although everyone is different? Or is the fact that everyone is different, does that mean that they would require different interventions? Because you have to think of what is already there before you add something. And because you have to understand what is your treatment doing? How does it work? For who does it work? And who is that person you have in front of you? So the one size does not fit all. We also have the t-shirt that is one of my favorite, but not everyone's favorite, which is statistics don't get me. So statistics <laughs> don't get me. So we have to remember that statistics get the average, but not necessarily the person in front of you. So it also means uh, on the back of all of our t-shirts, it says N equals one. So there's like the uniqueness the everyone is unique. And given that, it means that um, the best you can do is understand how things work and why things work and try to work around uh, the causal knowledge from there. So most people who work in philosophy of causation, they're going to say you need both the kind of statistical evidence and the mechanistic evidence. I can I can be happy with that. But I, I would say if you, if you really understand what you're doing, like with the parachutes and the falling, you don't really want to do an RCT um, to harm a lot of people. But yeah, uh, if you have the RCT, it's fine. I'm going to be happy with that. And can we buy those t-shirts? Because I assure you, if we can, you'll see me wearing one in our next episode of Podchat Live. I think we've dumped all of the t-shirts now on uh, Roger Carey. We have a word cloud t-shirt that I have more of where we have, uh, where we had a conference called the guidelines challenge. And we had a word cloud for everything that the guidelines cannot capture, which was things like uniqueness and mechanisms, complexity, uh, individual variations. Yeah, stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm, I have some of those in my Sounds office. like I might need to uh, schmooze Roger on Twitter. So I'm not adverse to him, yeah. so I'll slide into his <laughs> slide into his DMs. Um, Craig, anything else you want to say no, before that, we wrap up? I think, I think that's a good note to finish on. So, look, just before I finish, I, I don't know whether the others have noticed that the light outside Alex's window is actually getting lighter. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the sun's coming up. So I just quickly Googled um, where Rani is, and I, I see the sunset about 15 minutes ago, but the light out your window is still there. Right? I mean, it must be a street light or something, is it? <laughs> no, no, this is, uh, this is Norway, and it gets dark very uh, late in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, look, look, thanks so much, Alex, for getting up so early, and thanks so much, Rani, for staying up so late. Um, yeah, yeah, this is my bedtime. Been, it's been an hour <laughs> and a half. It's 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 gone quickly. So, for those who have just joined, it's been an hour and a half. Um, later on today, Australian time, it'll be up on YouTube. The podcast version will have to be cut into two parts, so that that'll be there later on today. So, so thanks so much, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks for no having problem. us.